Good afternoon and welcome to Wednesdays at the Center, a series hosted by the John Hope Franklin Center and Duke University Center for International and Global Studies. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Anna Soon, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Sociology here at Duke University, who will be joined by Brian Steensland, Professor and Chair of Sociology at Indiana University Purdue University, Indianapolis, and Jamie Kunsinkas, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Sociology at Hamilton College. Today's talk is titled, Situating Spirituality and Asian Religions, a conversation about the study of spirituality and Asian religions in the global age. Now at this time, I will, it will hand it over to Professor Anna Sun. Thank you, Kevin, for your warm welcome and for your introduction. We're very grateful to the center for hosting this discussion. So Brian is a sociologist of religion who has been working on religion, culture, politics, and civic life. And Jamie um, is also a sociologist of religion who has been studying um, yoga, mindfulness movements, um, and also religion and politics um, and culture in American today. I myself is a sociologist of uh, Chinese religion and sociologist of knowledge. Brian and Jamie and I have known one another for a long time. And Brian, um, really, I think you're the one who led this project um, by bringing together an excellent group of scholars in around 2019 for us to think about spirituality today and how should we study it differently because um, the nature of spirituality um, developments uh, has been evolving. And we had our great conference um, in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. So over those two years, we, the three of us worked together with our uh, authors and brought together this, I think, fascinating volume, uh, if I may say so myself, uh, called Spiritual, Situating Spirituality, Context, Practice, and Power. I'm going to um, show you just um, the cover of our book. It um, came out of Oxford University Press in the end of 2021. And I'm also going to share screen to show you um, the page from Oxford University Press. And you can see the different parts of the book. Um, we have a co-authored introduction and with part one on context, part two on practice, part three on power, uh, totaling 17 uh, chapters, uh, written by authors who focus on spirituality in different parts of the world, not just the US, not just North America, but also Africa, Asia, South America. I am now going to turn to Brian. Um, Brian, uh, the floor is yours and let us hear from you your thoughts on our project as Spirituality Studies 2.0. Well, thank, thank you, Anna. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to say two things uh, as, as preface. Um, one is that this collaboration with Jamie and Anna has just been so fun and intellectually rewarding. And um, the academic life can be kind of an isolating life, one where we spend a lot of time in our heads and spend a lot of time just kind of with our own preoccupations. And so um, this has been a great example of the rewards, hopefully the intellectual rewards, but certainly the interpersonal rewards and emotional rewards of uh, work, working on a team. And so I, I just really value um, the opportunity that we've had to work together for the last couple of years. Um, Paul Farmer, who some of you might, might know, he's a, a kind of global medical, health expert who just passed away. Um, 
a lot of the obituaries that were written about him had a quote where he, he says the great honor of his life has been working together with other people on hard things. And working together on hard things, um, not that this particular volume was like solving a global health problem, but um, working together is, is, is dynamite. And so it's, it's been really fun. Um, the second thing that I should say as, as preface is um, I, I am not a scholar of Asian religions. So um, I, I'm gonna try and set the table for this project and then uh, hand the floor back over to Jamie and, and Anna. Um, I, I, uh, I study American religion and I have a long standing interest in spiritual practices. And in 2016, I fielded a survey on American spiritual practices. And so kind of immersed myself in research on spirituality. And one of the things that frustrated me about the kind of state of the field is the kind of assumption that spirituality is an individuated idiosyncratic affair, that it is about authenticity to self, that uh, it is about um, self-knowledge and, 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 and seeking and authenticity. And all these things kind of connote that spirituality and therefore the study of spirituality is kind of off limits to scholars like Anna and Jamie and I, who are sociologists who study the sociology of whatever it is that we're studying. So unlike religion, which we all recognize as being kind of fundamentally social and sociological, the study of spirituality kind of had this overly individuated connotation. And that's true for the definition of spirituality, which is often defined in individual terms. It's defined in terms of individual experience. Um, the measures that we use to study spirituality are often individual level variables. The, the juxtaposition on a lot of surveys between what counts as spiritual and what counts as religious loads all the communal collective stuff on the religion side and all the, the individual stuff on the, on the spiritual side. So again and again, there was this kind of sense that spirituality was kind of off limits to sociological analysis. And if there is a central thesis to the book, it is that spirituality is just as eminently social, to use Durkheim's terminology, it is just as eminently social as religion is, um, even though the discourse of spirituality is a, is a highly individuated discourse. So that kind of sets up this kind of recognition that spirituality is social just opens up a whole bunch of avenues for interesting conversation and analysis. We were not the first people to recognize and see that um, spirituality is social, but we tried to, to bring together what we saw as some kind of disparate threads of this recognition that spirituality is social and kind of tie them together in a framework. So let me just say a little bit about that framework. Um, to say that spirituality is social suggests that both the lived experience of being a spiritual person is soci so sociologically influenced um, through probably unrecognized or underrecognized social processes. A lot of spirituality happens in groups. A lot of it is supported by collective discourses. A lot of it is afforded by things that we call affordances, the, the books that people read, the places that people go. All of these things are kind of fundamentally sociological. So what we could call the emic experience of spirituality is a social one and therefore kind of um, open to sociological analysis. And, and then, and maybe this is a little bit harder for the kind of rank and file spiritual person to get their, their heads around because it's unfamiliar, the whole category of spirituality um, as a kind of analytic term and as an analytic concept is also socially defined and socially prescribed. What counts as spiritual, what is counted as secular or as religious as opposed to being spiritual. Those are analytic distinctions, not real world distinctions. And that, that set of analytic distinctions um, is also socially prescribed too. So how do we think about what this 
this socialness of spirituality is and how, what are some angles of vision and points of entree for, for studying this, we, we distinguish between the importance of context and the importance of, of practice, particularly social practice, collective practice, and, and power as kind of three ways that we can understand the sociological valences, the sociological antecedents, the sociological consequences of spirituality, spiritual experience, spiritual expression, spirituality as a term. And, and so the, the kind of link to context being religious context or geopolitical context, something that's highly relevant to what we're gathered here today to talk about, um, shows up across the book because um, Asian religion or Asian religiosity um, is also about context. It's also about power and it's also about practice. And, and so it, it, the, the way that we would approach um, understanding what, what I guess we're gonna call here Asian spirituality really cuts across the way that we talk about context, practice, and, and power. If there's one thing that I think a lot of the, the chapters share, it's, um, and I think Anna's chapter, chapter in, this, in this book does a particularly good job of highlighting this. If there's one thing that they share or that kind of thematically links them is that we see spirituality as a fundamentally relational concept. Um, that what spirituality means, what, how it is experienced um, is, understood and experienced in light of the others that spirituality has. And so if, if, if spirituality is being discussed in a largely monotheistic religious context, um, spirituality is understood vis-a-vis -vis or against that monotheistic religious context. If spirituality is being discussed in a largely secular context, maybe a pluralistic secular context, it has a whole different set of connotations and meanings and lived experiences. So it's that relational way that we think about spirituality and the, the kind of contrast between spirituality and not spirituality that I, I would say is some of the connective tissue that, that links both the different pieces of our own agendas and the the work that shows up in the in the chapters. So I'm going to throw the ball back to you, Anna. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for that discussion. Um, I think the role Asian religion plays in our thinking is that it isn't an area we study, one of many areas, but rather by looking at the issue of spirituality in the context of Asian religions, it challenges our fundamental conception of um, terms such as religion and spirituality. It makes us rethink what we take for granted. So now I'm going to share a screen to show you um, something, um, um, a few slides uh, from a PowerPoint. So I want to talk about very briefly looking for religion and spirituality in contemporary China. So I'm going to speak of the boundary work of religion and spirituality. This is what Brian speaks of as a relational nature between religion and spirituality. I will speak of the Chinese spiritual milieu and how we think about spirituality um, in light of this Chinese case. So when we speak of spirituality and religion today, there's often an implicit assumption that there's a structural symmetry between them. Religion and spirituality seem to exist side by side as social facts. To many, they appear to, to be defined independent of each other, each having properties that sets it inherently apart. So in this conception, although spirituality may be less clearly defined as religion, it is perceived as having its own intrinsic properties. Outside of these two spheres, we have what we think of the secular, the world in which neither the religious nor the spiritual has significant social, political, or epistemological authority. So this is what we think of, not very critically, of the secular religion and spirituality. So religion is really the concept that dominates our imagination. 
But in our edited volume um, and in my chapter, I suggest that it is time to reconsider the conventional frame that views religion and spirituality as independent analytical concepts. They are very much relational. In other words, religion and spirituality are concepts defined in relation to each other rather than independently. What they have in common is their intentional engagements with the sacred, which have immense richness and extraordinary diversity across human societies. I further suggest, as a sociologist of religion as well as sociologist of knowledge, that the relational nature of these two concepts is connected to the larger social and political context in which they are used and understood. For example, in the US, the basic assumptions about religion are characteristic of predominantly monotheistic religious worlds. In such worlds, genuinely pluralistic and inclusive as they might be, one is supposed to have an exclusive religious identity. One cannot be a Protestant or Catholic at once, for example, and one is supposed to have a set of beliefs and practices that are implicitly, if not ex explicitly exclusive. One cannot pray to Jesus Christ and the Guayin Buddha Sava at once. And one's affiliation is aligned with one's religious identity. But in case of China, the notions of the set apart religion and the exclusive form of religious identity as formed in the monotheistic context and much developed by scholars globally in the 19th and 20th centuries have been intimately connected with the modernization agenda of the state since the 10th to the 20th century when the Chinese state modeled its classification of religions after that of the West. So people in China do speak of religious identities. However, most people in China today who follow polytheistic religious traditions such as Confucianism or Taoism still claim no religious identity. So in my interviews, I have heard people speaking of religious identity as something the monotheists have. So in traditional as well as in contemporary China, it is not the case that the Chinese are less religious. It is that they engage with the sacred differently. So China is not the, least, the world's least religious country, even though we may think so um, by looking at survey data. But in China, we have monotheism. Here we have a Catholic uh, pilgrim site. We have polytheistic Taoist traditions. We have Buddhist practices and Confucian practices shared by the majority of the population. So this is a survey from 2016. Uh, we have um, about 75% of the people who conduct ancestral rituals on the ritual date of Qingming, as well as many other important ritual dates. Um, under 20% of the people did not conduct ancestral rites in the past year. So as you can see, um, the Chinese are in fact extremely involved in religious ritual life. So I use the term spiritual milieu to speak of people in China who engage in ritual practices in, from different religious traditions. This spiritual milieu consists of two kits for people to engage in ritual activities and to make sense of life experiences through various religious and ethical systems of meaning. It produces spiritual habitus that is embodied and often gendered. And this shared spiritual milieu maintains a shared cosmology and sacred ritual calendar that is shared again by the majority of the Chinese people who do not claim any religious identity. So in this context, religion denotes a specific expression and form of religious life. One with stricter boundaries, firmer religious identities, and often more robust devotional practice, 
and a professional religious class that guides and disciplines the followers' beliefs and behaviors. To be religious in this spiritual milieu in China is to draw explicit boundaries around oneself and the religious institution one belongs to. So as a sociologist, uh, Andrew Abbott puts it, social entity, entities come into existence when social actors tie social boundaries together in certain ways. Boundaries come first, then entities. And this might be the case for Chinese religious slash spiritual life in general. Religion, a social thing, exists only when its boundaries are tied together by social actors and a specific historical, cultural, and political circumstances. To speak metaphorically, religions are visible, significant islands in the sea of the spiritual milieu. So here is how one can reconceptualize the relationship, relational nature between religion and spirituality in a society like China, where you have a mixture of monotheistic and polytheistic practices. So we have the secular and we have the spiritual milieu. And religions are entities with stricter boundaries, more clear, clear uh, identities um, that mark itself as separate from the spiritual milieu, but it is still part of it. I shall end here and pass this to Jamie. Thank you so much, Anna and Brian um, for teeing me up. Um, so I'm gonna shift focus a little bit. So for the book, I focused on the section um, and mostly edited the section on power and how power shapes spirituality. Um, and as someone who studies how mindfulness um, has traveled across groups of people and across institutions, I wanted to start by just framing mindfulness not, or framing spirituality writ large as more of a verb, as more of a doing, as something experienced, as something practiced, something ever adapted and ever in process, uh, rather than thinking of it as a noun fixed in time and space. Um, I also think it's important to think about spirituality as plural and heterogeneous, so it's containing a lot of different forms. And the forms that I'm gonna talk about are really different than the ones that Anna was just talking about in China. And as she was talking about, so we're conceptualizing spirituality as this boundary object. It's shaped by its con context and it's porous at that. So it takes on elements of the context that it's a part of. Um, so looking specifically at mindfulness as I do in my chapter and yoga as well, you can see how these adaptations have shaped what the practices are, how people understand them, how they're framed, how they're moved across places and institutions and how they impact people in different ways. Um, so in my, in my chapter and in my monograph, The Mindful Elite, I examine how professionals and elites have adapted mindfulness to appeal to other affluent people um, across powerful organizations and institutions, as well as to mainstream Americans. Um, at the vanguard of the mindfulness movement is John Kabat-Zinn. Um, he's a PhD. He's also a student of Zen Buddhism, um, and he was a founding member of the Cambridge Zen Center. Um, so he developed his mindfulness-based stress reduction program um, beginning in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and he took yoga and he took his studies and practices from Buddhism and he translated them into secularized practices to appeal to people in pain, people with stress, people using healthcare services. Um, he, he worked and talked and strategized on how to make mindfulness more popular with several other organizations and groups of people. Um, and in a working group report from 1994 um, for the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, he discussed their strategy for making mindfulness more popular in the United States um, and internationally. And so he writes in this report, it's important to point out that there should and can be no fixed form for this to happen. Meditative pathways, teachers, and programs cannot be cloned, although effective models might be adapted and modified, as has been the case in medical and educational settings with mindfulness-based stress reduction. Appropriate forms and vehicles need to develop out of personal contemplative experiences, meditation practices, and visions of what might be possible 
of the individuals who undertake to bring contemplative dimension into mainstream life in society. These forms will have to interface in appropriate ways with the social terrain and be sensitive to professional, institutional, generational, and ethnic cultures and their values. And so from the get-go, he assumed and strategized that it was okay for people to adapt mindfulness as they moved it into new institutions and locations. Um, so consequently, mindfulness never had a single regulatory body that oversaw training and certified mindfulness educators um, through one official outlet. Um, so it's different from a religion in that respect where it just moved in all of these directions and all of these different people adapted it as they saw fit. Um, so since then, mindfulness has moved into top businesses. So Fortune 100 companies like Google, um, into financial services and venture capital, um, into healthcare, the military, sports. Um, so in basketball, for example, um, law, business, prisons, and elsewhere. And so you see it moving everywhere. And as it moves, it changes. Um, and so in particular, I wanted to share one example that is um, pretty striking to people about how mindfulness was adapted um, for soldiers, for law enforcement, and for veterans. Um, if you want to pop back onto the slide. Um, so this, the quote that I'm going to show is from someone who is bringing mindfulness to um, to veterans and to law enforcement officers. Um, so Michael Taylor, he was a former Air Force pilot who studied Karma Kagyu Buddhism at Naropa University. Um, he created his program, as he said, to appeal to blue collar, get her done kind of guys. Um, he drew from a mission oriented operational perspective used in the military as well as from sports performance language. So this is a really masculine version of mindfulness. Um, and as you can see in this quote from him, he, he said to me in an interview, um, we teach him breathing techniques in terms of kind of regulating the nervous system. Naropa is very much Kagyu and our team comes very much from that tradition. And so we start off, we start out with the nervous system regulation pieces and then we transition into teaching them shamatha and Vipassana. And the shamatha, we call it riding the breath and Vipassana, we call it the zone but all of our techniques are pulled from the pantheon of Tibetan Buddhist practices, all of it. And so here you see this adaptation, the secularization um, of Buddhist inspired practices into a secular masculine professional sphere. Um, you can see, so he removed explicit references to Buddhism. He brought in language that would be familiar and resonant to his intended audience. He didn't call it a mindfulness program. He said, like, I'm even, far, even farther out there. He said, my program is mind training. Um, and he said, we're not talking about meditation. We're not doing anything they'd consider weird or unusual. Um, we don't even use the word meditation. We don't use the word mindfulness. It's all couched in science in terms of the neuroscience and ner nervous system regulation. Um, it's under the rubric of peak performance um, in terms of what we present to them. And so you can see how much Buddhist, so Kagyu, uh, Karma Kagyu Buddhism was changed as he moved it into um, a program to appeal to the military. Um, their program even used um, military and law enforcement training to teach mindfulness. So using real guns and multiple assailants, um, which he suggested would give ordinary meditation teachers and a lot of therapists a conniption fit. Um, so some have looked at these programs in the military for soldiers in the army and programs um, like Taylor's and question like where have the Buddhist ethics gone? Um, is he deviating from central Buddhist tenets not to kill or incite harm to others um, in his effort to appeal and train and be of use to law enforcement in the military? Um, his argument is that he's trying to relieve suffering and focus attention um, of these soldiers and these law enforcement officers. Um, so you can see, um, you can start to see how the institutions that they're moving in have such a profound impact on what these practices are, why they're used, um, who's using them and for what purposes. And you can see how elements of more traditional Buddhist traditions are taken out. Um, so the next example I wanna show you is just to, something um, to raise awareness about, about how at this point, meditation and yoga are so popular that a lot of non-practitioners are recommending the practices as therapeutic tools for their clients. Um, and actually, so I have 
Um, this happened to me this morning. Um, I went to the dentist. I have a dental problem and I have, I've been clenching my teeth from stress. And the dentist actually said to me, like, why don't you meditate and do yoga? And I looked at him and I was like, I am the mom of two children under the age of five who are unvaccinated during a global pandemic. I am the chair of my department. Um, and I'm still teaching my classes and doing my research. And I said, you know, like, I, I just don't think mindfulness <laughs> and yoga are going to cut it. Um, and so that's just an example of how it's being used as an individual solution to stress, to anxiety, to institutional and social, larger social problems. Um, and it's, it's insufficient. Um, the example I have here is even more problematic. Um, it shows how it can be used as a tool to, um, to gloss over racism um, and to make racism the personal problem of the victim. Um, and so this is a quote that I pulled from a Humans of New York episode. Um, the woman speaking is a middle-aged Black woman, and she discusses the following um, experience. So she says, everyone's looking in and doing all of this inward reflection. If you're unhappy, it's because of you. Your unhappiness isn't a reflection of any systemic imbalance that we could address together. Um, it's a you problem. I worked the most shit job when I moved back to New York last year. I was told instead of me becoming upset because someone spoken to me in a way that's horribly, horrifically disrespectful, unprofessional, and above all, probably legal, I was told just take a few deep breaths. Maybe you should get the mindfulness app, the meditation app. Are you serious? The things you're saying are not only not relevant to my job. Why are you commenting on my body? Why are you commenting my weight? Why are you commenting on my hair? Don't tell me to meditate my frustration away because my frustration is valid and it's real and it's coming from a genuine place. And I wouldn't be frustrated if it didn't matter. So here you can see how her manager is using mindfulness as a way to take the, the blame for problems of systemic racism and interpersonal racism and prejudice um, and instead saying, oh, you feel uncomfortable? Go make yourself feel more comfortable by doing a mindfulness app. And so here you can see how the context is really important in understanding what's happening here um, and how spirituality is being used as a tool by someone in a position of power. Um, the last example, how much time do I have? <laughs> a couple more minutes. Um, so I'll go through the last example um, relatively quickly. Um, and this example is meant to show how the teacher may be portraying spirituality or spiritual practices in one way, and it can be received by audiences in quite a different way. Um, and so having different perspectives and what's happening and acknowledging these gaps in transmission are also really important to understand and how they happen in pattern ways in different secular locations. Um, and so the class that I studied with this group of students was a yoga class at a secular elite college. Um, I attended the class and took field notes and I had several students doing the same. And the students also interviewed their peers um, and got a perspective that I don't think I ever could have gotten on my own. Um, and so I attended this class and my, what I understood as happening was there was this teacher, she had this gruff voice, um, the students loved her. She seemed like really tough. Um, but what I saw her doing was bringing together language around exercise and strength building with spiritual language and with some Buddhist language. Um, so in the beginning and the end of the practice um, that I'm referring to, she talked about the wisdom mind. So she said, listen to the wisdom mind to be still. She said, um, at the end of the practice, she said, um, and this comes back to Buddhist, um, Buddhist prayers. So may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you have loving kindness, metta, may everyone you meet have it too. Um, but then after she talked about some of these spiritual components, she kind of like returned to her gruff um, exterior and said, well, let's get to that ab workout, cut out the chatter. Um, and so what I saw was this admixture of these different influences shaping her class. Um, but what was interesting was the student's perspective and the students interviewed, um, it's important to mention, it, it was a group of mostly athletes, secular athletes and members of Greek societies, um, students who frequented the party scene uh, pretty regularly. Um, and so they were coming at it and thinking like, wow, this is a place where a lot of popular kids go. Um, and they like to go there for the workout. They like to go there to see their friends and other people they were attracted to. They thought it was a place to be seen. 
Um, they mentioned like watching themselves in the mirror and being self-conscious about how their bodies look to their peers around them. Um, and when we asked like, okay, so is this a spiritual experience for you? That most of them didn't really have the language to process it. And so they'd say things like, well, I felt sleepy or um, I felt calm or it made me, it gave me space to think about questions like what's the meaning of life? But then we'd say, so is that spiritual? And like one student said, well, maybe, um, I guess so. Um, other students said, no, like I'm not spiritual or I, I get spirituality, but it's not me. Um, so you could see that they weren't diving into those elements of what she was teaching, um, but they were taking away the exercise. They were applying her, let, her words of wisdom in like situations out of the class with their friends. Um, but describing it in a totally secular way. Um, so I just thought it was a really interesting example to show how attenuated Buddhist inspired practices can be as they move into particularly secular locations. Um, and also just seeing how situating yoga in this, um, this, like, this youth culture at this secular college, you could see how much their normative peer culture was shaping how they understood these practices and made sense of them and applied them in their lives. And so stepping back from all of these cases, I just want um, to reiterate the importance of looking at spirituality in a contextualized way, but also looking at how systems of power shape what spiritual practices are appealing, what are possible, what are deemed possible, um, the uses to which they're put, but also how they affect different groups of people. Um, so that's the agenda. That's one of the agendas that we're trying to set with this book is inspiring future researchers to dig more into these comparisons um, and unpack all of the ways that spirituality is so profoundly shaped by the context and the, the hierarchies that it's embedded in. So thank you so much. That was great, Jamie. So I have, um, I'm teaching a class called Spiritual But Not Religious this semester. Um, hello, everyone uh, who are here listening. They prepared questions for us ahead of time. So I, they are all such great questions, but I'm just going to ask two um, to, to all three of us. Um, and then we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. The first question is, um, what brought, you, what brought you to the study of, of spirituality? This is from Jessica. And what have you learned about your own cultivation uh, through your investigation? Brian, do you want to go first? Sure. So it's a two-parted question. How did I come to it and what have I learned? Is that right? Yeah, personally. So, um, so I have had a personal interest in spiritual practices for a long time, and uh, I made a, a transition from one higher ed institution to another and kind of fell in with some people who were um, putting together a research project on ritual. And ritual as a term and as the way it's studied has a very kind of organizational doctrine based kind of connotation and that I, I i started thinking well you know if we're going to learn about american religion um maybe we should reorient our study from the study of religious ritual per se to spiritual practice which can be collective can also be individual and that kind of aligned with my own um, you know, long, long-standing biographical or autobiographical interest in spiritual practices as well. So, um, I'd say my my personal interest predated my academic interest. Um, what I've seen through kind of digging into the research on spiritual practice is how incredibly formative it can be, um, both for things that we kind of hear in the com in the in the media about you know um equanimity and harmony and equipose and all those things but um it it i i do think that intentional repetitive practice of a whole variety of types um is beneficial for people now what i'm interested in and i know that jamie is interested in this too is um how does that uh, kind of emanate outward 
from a kind of individual focus and you know the kind of pejorative term would be like a self-centeredness but here i mean it descriptively how does how does spirituality go from being centered on the self to also being centered on on others and what is that connective tissue like is does it come through practices does it come through the community in which the practices are embedded does it come through um you know reading text and going to workshops and attending retreats and but it's 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 that self society connection that um i think is kind of built into organized religion that isn't necessarily built into at least kind of contemporary American spirituality, the discourse of it. And, and so I find dissatisfying the kind of lack of explicit connection between the way spiritual practices are often engaged in and the, the outward focus, um, the social connectedness that again, if, if we contrast it to religion, which given my own biography and the fact that I'm in modern America, that's my juxtaposition, but it's not everyone's, right? It's, it's, that, it's that linkage that um, I find a little bit wanting and think a lot about what we as a society and we as kind of members of organizations can do to forge a, a clearer connection there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Jamie. So this is tricky. Um, there's always so many layers to these answers. Um, but so one reason I was interested in studying Buddhism um, was my dad died. Um, and so the Buddhists think a lot about dying. Um, so initially I was curious in studying, doing an ethnography of a Buddhist center in Indiana. Um, but when I got there, there was all of these people talking about neuroscientific research and how it basically was proving that meditation works and it's good for you. Um, and as a sociologist and not a lot of lay people read all the things that we write, I was perplexed um, by this, the fact that here are these predominantly white meditators in a Buddhist center in Indiana who are talking about um, like very recent neuroscientific findings in peer reviewed journals. Um, and so then I kind of, I just got curious, like where is this coming from? How is meditation getting legitimized among like white converts in America? And then I, um, uh, a nun had come through the center and she knew the founder of the Mind and Life Institute, which is one of the main um, organizations, which has basically been an engine getting this research and, um, out on Buddhism and convening the Dalai Lama with scientists um, and building this coalition, um, this group of people promoting mindfulness. Um, and so I started interviewing uh, members of their group and it kind of just kept spreading and I was doing this research in 2008 and it was all unfolding where people would just point me to the next direction it was heading like oh I heard something's going on in Silicon Valley like go check that out um, go look at this Zen in the brain retreat in New Mexico so I'd head over there like go look at this lab at University of Wisconsin so I just popped all over the place following where it was going as it was moving and all of these people were connecting um, and it was a really fortuitous moment to study mindfulness. Um, I don't think I could have studied it even years later. Um, but as Brian mentioned, um, I think I was looking, so how, does, how do these practices that people are bringing into institutions as a way of trying to change them, how does that land? Um, do these changes happen? Do these larger organization, organizational changes in culture and values or in structures happen when you bring a meditation program in? Um, and I kept looking for evidence and I couldn't find any. Um, people were really talking about mindfulness in a very individualistic kind of way. Um, but one of the interesting things about the research I'm doing now, and this is Brian's doing some of this research as well, is that I think I was looking in the wrong direction. Um, I think that the institutions are so powerful that mindfulness became, you know, kind of marginalized or stuck, you know, in the basement or, or, or seen as a therapeutic individual health practice to reduce stress or increase emotional awareness. Um, and it never really was connected with the centers of power in these organizations. So it never really had an integral impact in most of the 60 some organizations that I, I talked to or connected with. Um, but 
um, some of the new research that I'm doing looking at spiritual practices suggests that spiritual practitioners are, you know, very likely to vote. They're very likely to engage in civic work. Um, and so I think I was looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, and so now um, Brian's doing this work as well, or we're starting to try to figure out, is spirituality operating like religion under what conditions, in what groups, among what people, um, and how does it have larger impacts on collective life? And so that's where I'm heading and the questions that I'm currently interested in. I can't wait to see your findings, your new project. This is really exciting. So I will briefly address this question too, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Um, I see um, a couple of questions in chats already. So um, this is personal for me as well, and in two ways. The first is that there's this assumption that the Chinese are irreligious. This is an assumption that goes way back but you see it still in social scientific studies because all the data suggests the Chinese do not have religious identity, so they are certainly not religious. So that made me really question the fundamental conception of religion and whether it is something that we have to think about differently in different social contexts. So what I was speaking of as a relational nature between religion and spirituality. So the Chinese are, are very much engaged in religious um, activities, but religion does not function as a concept in the same way in China as in a monotheistic society such as the US. The other side of my discontent with these concepts is that we have very great Asian religious traditions, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, um, Confucianism, but when they come to the US, when they come to the West, they become spirituality. So we have, as you show us, uh, Jamie, that mindfulness gets incorporated into, um, into a therapeutic or therapeutic culture, into a popular practice, but it doesn't get the kind of um, attention um, that religion gets. So Asian religion gets, gets uh, kind of subordinated into this category of spirituality in our world where uh, Trudeau Christianity still really uh, have this strong presence as a dominant form of religion. So this makes me think that this issues of boundary work are is everywhere to be seen in China as well as in the US. So today, when someone speaks of spirituality, I ask, what's the context? What's the history of that society? What are the dominant forms of the religion there before I use the term spirituality? Let's open to a couple of questions, a couple more questions. Um, uh, I see David Collins asking um, whether meditative experience is or is not social. Jamie, do you want to take this one? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Mikhail Padges has this wonderful chapter in the book on collective solitude. And so what she studies is she studies Goenka meditation retreats, and she shows all of the ways that these seemingly very, you know, practices that are portrayed as very individual actually are often taught and transmitted through collective vehicles like these meditation retreats. And um, she goes into, she's a wonderful um, micro sociologist going in fine grain detail into how you know, even when you're sitting there and you think you're in your mind, oftentimes meditators are aware of, you know, their own breath and how it's perceived by the person next to them. Um, if someone coughs across the room, other people are more likely to cough or fidget. Um, so she looked at how there is, there is sociality, even in practices that people might psychologically understand as more individualistic. Um, but when you look at how these practices are taught, the ideologies um, that are associated with them, um, just how people are taught to interact in these different spaces. It's very deeply um, sociological. So unpacking how solitude, how silence, how all of that can be seen as something normatively social and socially taught. Um, so yeah, that's a wonderful chapter. She also has a book called Inward, um, which is a great reference. Other questions from the audience? Matthew Hayes has his hand raised, if you can unmute him, or if he can unmute himself. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for taking my, my question. I, I just wanted to ask a, a kind of a follow-up question about uh, power and about influence. And this goes back to something that Brian uh, mentioned at the top about um, spirituality as a kind of a social and collective endeavor, you know, akin to to religion, at least in, in some ways. And, but also to what Jamie was mentioning about the lack of a, a kind of a governing body, I guess, to, at least in the case of, of mindfulness practice. Um, you know, when I think about collective aspects of religion, I, I think about the kind of interconnected nature of communities and uh, uh, followers and, and things like that, but also about a, a sort of central node of institutional authority. You know that sort of organizes and and taxonomizes and disseminates and maintains uh, religious knowledge, right, within these within these communities. So, I'm wondering what institutional authorities or or kind of nodes do you locate in these Asian spiritual communities in your book, uh, if we're to take these two worlds as similar, right, similarly collective and similarly connected uh, in that way. I guess to, to ask it another way, I'm sort of wondering if they all follow. Jamie's model of mindfulness as having sort of no or a very diffuse central authority, uh, if that makes sense. Are there sort of exceptions to this rule or do they all kind of cohere? Thank you. Um, I can start off, but I'm curious what everyone else thinks too. Um, so across the different cases, um, if you think back to the models that Anna was showing, I think we've got different kind of larger macro contexts um, and they're all different at different levels. So considering like the state government at hand, considering um, whether, you know, people are interpreting and using spiritual practices through religious organizations, which they are in some of the examples like in Ann Swidler's chapter. Um, other places it's happening outside like in my chapter, um, but also you can see, so Rachel Ronaldo has another chapter on Muslims in Indonesia. Um, and that chapter is particularly interesting as well because it shows how um, Sufism and other aspects of Islamic spirituality have kind of like dovetailed at different moments um, with mainstream Islam, um, which has been tied to the state in Indonesia. And so what we're doing is we're looking at different contexts where um, all of these situations are different. Um, in an effort just to kind of lay out these comparisons and raise it as a question um, and hopefully inspire other people to, to look for other kinds of patterns. So this this is outside my, my area, but since the question was couched in terms of where authority resides, um, if we kind of use the Weberian distinction between bureaucratic authority and charismatic authority, I think a lot of it resides in charismatic leadership that is less reproducible over time and less embedded in codified doctrine and you know documents of various types with sanctions associated with them and such. If we if we think about the spiritual milieu, at least in the US and the modern West, and I'm a little bit more reluctant to generalize outside of that, um, a lot of the authority is really, <clears throat> um, I don't wanna say, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's charismatic in nature. It's not that the, the authority isn't there, it's that it's, it's less likely to extend beyond the charism of the leader. Um, so it, it's not a, it's not, it's not that authority doesn't exist, but it, it looks different. I, I agree with both of you. So I am going to pass on this question. I think you answered them, answered perfectly. Um, David. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. So I had asked the question about social dimensions of meditation, and I thought uh, Professor Jamie's reply was was fascinating but i'd like to offer a little more challenging uh, example i'm largely buddhist um, the way religion of course is constructed in the west isn't as uh, professor sun has uh, highlighted it's 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 distinctive to 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 our culture um, but anyway i've had uh, 
rather rich, longstanding uh, training in meditation procedures, including uh, the absorptive jhana states from old school Buddhism, which um, Kabat-Zinn and the Vipassana folks coming out of Burma had left, largely left out, but they're remarkable. And I've had the experience of waking up at night out of dreamless sleep in the middle of the sequence. So the challenge is, is that a religious experience, a spiritual experience, a socially constructed experience, or neuroscientific experience? Thanks very much. I would say it is all of the above. Uh, these are not exclusive uh, categories. Um, it is a social experience because you have the language to describe it as such and such sequence. So that discourse, that ritual discourse is in itself social. It is a spiritual experience inside a religious tradition. And it is um, also a religious experience if you uh, take Buddhism um, as um, the foundational um, 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 ethical ritual and um, uh, ethical ritual spiritual practice in your in your own life. So if you call yourself a Buddhist, then that would also be a religious experience as well as a spiritual one. You are doing spiritual exercise inside Buddhism. Would you agree, Jamie? Yeah, and I wanted to build on that. So Mikhail Pagis and Dan Winchester have a wonderful new article about these spiritual ruptures and states and how they put you in these liminal states and kind of enable these cognitive openings where um, people then have to draw on the cultural tools that they have at hand to make sense of them. And that influences the impact that they have. So does like the way you interpret it as like, oh, was that related to sleep? Or was that something that, you know, just happened and I am gonna let it go and keep moving? Or is it something I'm gonna hang on to and interpret with a certain kind of meaning and then reaffirm my commitment to my practices within Buddhist traditions? So um, definitely worth checking out their article because it looks at like that, that process of cognitive meaning making in a really sophisticated and helpful way. I'll offer real quick how much of contemplative practices, whether it's the via negativa folks in the West or the Zen folks in the East are looking to question our frameworks of interpretation. Put a little glibly, but sincerely, it's how much of it's an exercise of honesty, looking at how we look at things. So your comments are cogent, they're rich, but I'm a little hesitant to give so much weight over to the interpretive framework when such emphasis in these particular styles of practices are explicitly directed towards questioning our frameworks, looking at how we look at things. Thanks again. Thank you so much for that question. I can see that our hour is up so um, thank you all for attending. So now we have, we're gonna have an informal discussion with the students. We're going to use this as a virtual classroom. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, and thank you everyone for making this possible. Um, we are going to just stay here uh, for our informal conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor, Stein, Professor Stainsland and Professor Kun Sinkus, and thank you all for attending today at Wednesdays at the Center. We'll continue two weeks from, to, from now, which would be on March 16th, uh, with a uh, subject entitled Hong Kong Takes Flight, uh, Commercial Aviation and the Making of a Global Hub with uh, John Wong, Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong. So thank you again. Hope that you come back on Wednesday, March 16th. Thanks everyone for this very great uh, discussion. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for joining us.